What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Today, uh, as always, joined with Michael Murray through the screen, and we are very happy to also be joined by Dr. Mike Isratel. Dr. Mike, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Of course, of course. Super excited to have you on and get into uh, our discussion. And today, we kind of want to take a look at high-frequency training and kind of to get things rolling, we're kind of going to get your general position on it. And to give a little context for that, we kind of want to bring up the reviews done by Greg Knuckles and Brad Schoenfeld looking at high-frequency training in relation to muscle hypertrophy. So we on one side of the spectrum, we kind of have Greg Knuckles and his findings kind of looking at higher training frequencies being associated with hypertrophy. And then you look at Brad's findings, and when you equate volume, frequency doesn't seem to matter all that much. So I guess what we're, what we're kind of looking for here is, scientifically speaking, how can we kind of reconcile these different findings? Because, you know, we can kind of play around for ourselves and see what kind of frequency makes sense for us and what works. But in, in this kind of realm of trying to optimize uh, muscle mass and time is of the uh, issue here, I guess, of the matter. Uh, you know, where do you kind of stand on this to kind of optimize our own training and apply it in an, in an efficient way that can maximize our results? Yeah, that's a really good question. Just to address the sort of discrepancies between Greg's analysis and Brad's, and there have been a couple of other good ones. Um, I think Brad uses statistical tools that are slightly more conservative. So that has to be noted. Um, Greg's analysis um, compares absolute values um, and gives a percentage differences in hypertrophy potential. Um, if you applied a statistical analysis that included significance at any reasonable level, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, uh, those differences would never show up. Now, statistical significance has its detractions and they're, uh, they're rational, but it also has its advantages and um, we could just be seeing some statistical noise, although it's unlikely because Greg's analysis shows a, a pretty unidirectional trend in sort of the more frequency, the better. And when you see trends like that that are very, very consistent, you sort of tend to think there's something under, under the hood. Uh, another thing is that, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, research that Brad um, tallies is volume equated. And it's, uh, it's also been fairly well understood that for at least some duration of time, you can actually have a higher maximum recoverable volume with higher frequencies than with lower frequencies, uh, specifically on the research review that James Krieger puts out on his uh, weightology.net, highly, highly recommended. Uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty clear that something like eight sets per session per muscle group is, uh, you know, on average, very, very broad average, a good idea to do. And another way to phrase that is anything much less than four sets per session, probably on a continual basis is not remotely optimal for hypertrophy, but more, Pertinently to this discussion, anything much more than 12 or 15 sets per session starts to actually not grow any more muscle in that session at all. And so if you think about it, you say, okay, if I can only do productively, let's say, 10 sets per session, and anything more is just no, no more productive, just more damaging and stimulative to an equivalent extent, and then past 12 or 15 sets, it's actually more damaging than stimulative, so you get a U-shaped curve there. It's okay, I can do 10 sets productively per session, then how long does it take me to recover from 10 sets? Uh, let's say you worked up to it and you're sort of well in the swing of things. Well, you know, it might take uh, basically one full rest day between sessions to recover. Now, if you train twice a week with 10 sets per session, uh, can you recover between the sessions? Absolutely, totally. Now you're doing 20 sets a session. But you can also recover from three sessions per week because it only takes a day. And all of a sudden, you're doing 30 sets per week, and that will cause more hypertrophy. So volume-equated gains, the way you would do that is if you compare, you know, volume-equated, you would do three sessions of roughly six to seven sets per session versus two sessions of 10 sets, and you would see very similar hypertrophy. Uh, probably slightly better hypertrophy in the three-session group, but not always. And, uh, so you'd see almost essentially the same. But... Uh, at the same time, and this is why just reading studies with no background in training that oneself has experientially derived is a, a very limited enterprise because you could say, see, 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 <laughs> but then you, actually you go to real life and people actually go and train. Let's say you train your chest and someone trains, you know, for 10 sets, 
twice a week, and at the end of 10 sets, their chest is just destroyed, and they're like, whoa, man, that's, a, that's as good as workout gets. Like, any more would just be overkill. Um, but then someone tries to train chest three times a week, and they get to six and a half sets, right? And they go, I can, I can still do more. And they're like, no, 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 don't do more. Volume equated, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I can recover from more. I'm like, no, no, that's nonsense. Like, yeah, that ends up being kind of uh, a little bit backwards, right? So at the end of the day, uh, the volume equation thing is a very important ingredient, and we have to say that the volume equated does not always apply. Here's where it does not apply. In the short term, because uh, you can do very high frequencies and recover from them in the short term and get really grotesquely higher volumes per week, effective volumes per week. However, and this is a big part of something I'm sure we'll dig into later, is that higher frequencies like that are not as sustainable as lower frequencies. So what it really, uh, when you're examining the uh, effect of lower versus higher frequencies, probably one of the most important questions to ask, in addition to what works best, is for how long? Like if you told me I had to do one kind of frequency for the rest of my career, I would do no more than twice a week for most muscle groups because I can reliably recover from that week in, week out, no matter what. If you said that you know I had to gain as much muscle as I could in the next eight weeks, which is, by the way, almost exactly how all training studies work because you have something like eight to 16 weeks and the group that grows the most muscle wins, uh, in that sense, I would probably train every muscle group, gee whiz, you know, if I really wasn't concerned about tendon integrity at the end of it, mm -hmm. four times a week, I mean, for quads and chest and back, four times a week, and then for other muscles that are smaller, six times a week. Like, I would train biceps every single day. Uh, now, is that something you can sustainably do? Uh, absolutely not, right? So the training frequency question is is mitigated by, by duration of uh, applied frequency, and this is actually something that, to his immense credit, Greg Knuckles pointed out a long time ago in the strength context, is uh, Greg Knuckles didn't say squatting. You guys remember the squat uh, every day program? Program is a very charitable thing to call <laughs> the notion, idea. Um, yeah, I'm on the squat every day program. Someone's like, what's it like? Well, I don't actually have to write it down. Here yeah. it is, squat every day. <laughs> like, oh, what are the sets and reps? Just do squat every day. So uh, it's when people call some things a method. I'm like, that, that's not really a method. That's like a two-sentence description of something. So, you know, Greg was asked what his uh, thoughts on that were. And he said, I've actually done it. It's incredibly successful. Uh, but then the gains peter out really fast and you start to break into pieces. So stop before that last thing happens and then take a nice long break of normal training, let everything heal, and then do another bout of squatting every day. And that sort of points to the direction that high-frequency training is excellent if used in short, concentrated loading bouts. It is not something you want to do forever because uh, I can explain exactly why, but uh, it's not sustainable. Yeah. So kind of taking that into consideration there and that it's not a sustainable way to just go on forever – I kind of want to jump to what kind of what nutritional phase would benefit the most from a high a high frequency training approach, because you know you were you're worried about just kind of falling apart if you just keep on going and yeah. going with it. So uh, yeah, I guess would a massing phase or a a cutting phase be more appropriate for a high frequency yeah. training? There, there, so there are two concerns here. One is the need, uh, the the ability to benefit from a high frequency phase. So I think of the ability to benefit as like. Um, you know, what size bucket do you want to have in your hand when money's raining out of the sky? Like, you know, when there's a lot of money coming down, you want a big ass bucket. But when there's almost no money, a small bucket will be fine because you could just catch the dollar here, catch it there. And just one little tiny bucket will do just fine. So from that perspective, high frequency training has this immense power to grow muscle in the short term. Using it on a maintenance phase is kind of dumb because you're like, well, I, I'm not really eating to grow muscle. I'm not really gaining any muscle on that balance if I'm pretty lean already. Uh, uh, sweet time to fuck my body up <laughs> for, you know, and there are some muscle gains that are absolutely sort of nonlinear. You can lay a foundation of muscle gain under the hood and then actually realize it later. There's some good research coming out now. There's a lot of athletes have known this for a long time, but research is confirming and explaining this. But, you know, if I was a gambling person and I realized my body has a finite ability to recover, even over the lifespan of career uh, training, I would do high frequency training in its power. I would save it for a, a gaining phase. Right. But then again, that power is very anti catabolic. So you could also say, well, that's good for cutting phases too, because you're sure as hell not losing muscle with that much anabolic drive. Right. And higher frequencies. So, so if you do a low frequency approach, you gain muscle and then sort of nothing happens and you gain muscle and nothing happens for a while. Um, that's on a, a hypercaloric phase or a maintenance phase. 
if you do a very low frequency approach on dieting, you gain muscle and then you lose muscle and then you gain muscle. And so when there's not any stimulus, you start to slough off muscle pretty fast. So higher frequency, higher, not the highest, has some theoretical basis, some rationale for a fat loss approach as well. But the problem is there's another consideration of uh, uh, local and especially systemic fatigue. Uh, higher frequency training beats up everything. Locally, it beats up your uh, muscle and joints and connective tissues, um, but it also beats up the system, the central nervous system, the uh, endocrine system, and, and every other thing that's involved in keeping your body in one piece. So the next question to ask is, when can I best recover from that? And that's when you're eating lots of food in a mass gain phase. So uh, on, on just preserving muscle grounds, if we just look at it a very, very simply that a fat loss phase is a great time to do high frequency training but you just won't be able to recover much from it and you're going to end up overreaching like every other week and then and then what right so your frequency should definitely not be very low on a fat loss phase but it should be in that middle range uh for the most part on a maintenance phase you can do higher frequency but the little questions like for what and uh sometimes i like to i th think it helps to uh sort of red team yourself uh, in thinking uh try to like you know try to give arguments to your own best ideas like, you know, as I've always run into this. This is just like a story of my life. Like some smart kid in the gym, I think I have it all figured out. And he comes up and asks me why I do something. And I have no fuck clue why I do it. And I'm like, oh, my God, this motherfucker just broke me down. I'm like, shut <laughs> up, kid. I'm Dr. Mike from Facebook. Don't tell anyone you stumped me. Right. I would just ask. I would just ask myself shit that like a really smart, just like very curious and open minded person would ask. And one of them is like, imagine I was doing a high frequency mesocycle, but I was maintaining. And like a kid would come up and be like, hey, Dr. Mike, I'm a big fan. I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? How are you? And he'd be like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, high frequency training. He'd be like, oh, cool. So you're massing? He'd be like, no, I'm maintaining. He'd be like, why don't, Why would you mass instead? And I'd be like, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> that motherfucker got me. <laughs> Listen here, you little bitch. You don't tell anyone about this. <laughs> Matter of fact, we never met. So, you know, shit like that is, you know, a really good, I think, uh, sort of thinking tool. Like, okay, I think I haven't figured out why wouldn't I do it this other way? And you, if you could really quickly and easily refute it, yeah, you're probably under the right answer. But so can you do a high frequency on a, on a maintenance? You can. But then what if someone comes up to you and they're like, why aren't you gaining weight instead? Wouldn't that just make everything better? And you're like, huh? yes, it would. I'm an idiot. I'm just going to go right now and have a, uh, you know, a couple donuts, come back and start training again so we can be in a mass phase. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to look at it. Uh, have it have it, having random folks come up to you in the gym and uh, asking you why you're doing something, and if you don't have a good answer, I guess it's a sure. good way to, to quickly totally, make you think, and reevaluate. Well, you things. know, like you know, imagine coming up to like you know an engineer that, that launches like rockets for SpaceX or something. You, you can point to part of a rocket and be like, "Why is that there?" He's gonna have a fucking good answer for you. And he'd be like, "Why don't you put this battery component in this other part?" He'd be like, "Jesus, you're dumb." You don't understand weight distribution. You don't understand energy demands. You don't understand energy lag from cable to cable to cable. And you're like, oh, shit. He really has thought it through. But if you can ask yourself simple questions of why am I doing this? And then you can refute yourself. Like, you're in deep shit. You you should at least have, like, a pretty cogent idea. And if, if you can't really reliably defend what you're doing as definitely the right thing, at least it should be like there's no very good reason that I shouldn't be doing it. Like, for example, people on some of my videos would be like, why do you curl like this? And not like that. Like, why is it here and here? And I'm like, well, I, don't, I just don't think there's a really big difference between the two. There's no compelling reason for me to do one or the other. And then they go, okay, because that makes sense, right? I, I don't have the exact reason, but it sure as hell nothing as easy as like, hey, wouldn't high frequency work better if you ate more? They're like, yes, <laughs> uh, I should have thought that myself. For sure, for sure. And, and just just an aside, love love it in the Instagram comments. Uh, someone will ask you a question like that of, of why you're uh, curling with a certain grip or something, and you're just like. I feel it in my biceps. It feels good. I don't know, Strange. I, I, it imposes tension on the target muscle. <laughs> I know that's crazy, but I can explain. Great up answer. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Anyway, uh, going a little bit further with a little bit more of the nitty gritty here. Uh, on, on the muscle group level, are there any muscle groups particularly that you're skeptical about that potentially would not benefit from a high frequency approach? Muscles for which a relatively small amount of work um, and a long, uh, muscles that meet the following conditions. One, they are stimulated from a relatively small amount, a small number of work sets. Two, they recover very slowly between sessions that are minimally stimulating. That is, if you perceive a high degree of tension during the session, if you do some modicum of work that's not like ridiculous to show up and do one rep and then leave, and also do you get a robust pump in the muscle, uh, and, a, and a sensation that the muscle has been disrupted to some extent, some muscles, given all of those minimum conditions, just take longer to recover than others. 
In addition to that, some muscles are very long to warm up for. Like doing any proper quad training, you can't just start doing shit. If you do proper forearm training, like I just don't ever warm up to do wrist curls. Like the first rep is the warm up. Like that's mm-hmm. it. It's 110 pounds. Do this with like that's the easiest. If I get hurt on wrist curls, I would just quit the sport. Did you guys know if I cancel my Instagram, it'd be like he got hurt doing wrist curls. I, 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 <laughs> he talked about it on our show. So, um, so, so for example, if I'm doing quads. I'm going to warm up for 30 minutes probably. And I don't do any kind of crazy mobility shit. I just incrementally increase the load and take rest and stretch a little bit and find my groove and then potentiate with a heavy weight and then go. And that takes like 20 or 30 minutes, right? And someone said, okay, like you should train quads six times a week. Like, fuck, I'm really going to do a 30 minute warm up six times a week? Okay, it had better be worth it. And then you think, okay, like how many sets of quads do I do per session if I'm going to recover for the next the next day, the next day? Two, so I'm I'm spending twenty to thirty minutes of warming up to do two sets of quads, and after two sets of quads, and you guys have trained for a long time, you know how this feels. First two sets of quads feel the worst. Like the third set, you found your groove, you got a pump. The stimulus to fatigue ratio, at least on a perceived level, is fucking amazing. You're just jamming at that point. You're like, man, this is awesome. I want to do more. Now, look, six, seven, eight sets later, you're like, fuck this, cut me out. But, like, <laughs> pull me out, coach, just throw in the towel for yourself into the squat rack. <laughs> um, but, like, you know, gee, two sets, but, uh, you know, you're just getting grooving at that point. And that's the only way you'll be able to sustain six times a week training. So, so in essence, we come to the gym. Here's how high-frequency training is justified. Here's how it works. You come to the gym and you do a good workout. And however soon you recover to do another good workout, go. Okay, that's the highest frequency you'll be able to maintain. And, and we can even talk about partial recovery versus complete recovery, tissue-specific recovery. As long as your muscles are recovered and your, your connective tissue is recovered, it, as much as they have to be in order not to get you hurt, you're good to go. So even if your overall systemic fatigue is, is climbing throughout weeks and weeks and weeks, which you'll do anyway, that's okay because at least you can do a lot of really muscle-specific work, muscle, muscle recover, muscle recover, muscle recover, and then, of course, you have to deload and so on and so forth. It, if that's the key to, to determine trainer frequency. If to justify a higher than that training frequency, you have to really start modifying some shit, then it might be questionable as to whether or not it's worth it. For example, um, it, when you're dieting, you, uh, most people tend to eat relatively simple foods that don't taste super amazing. Why? Because most of the ingredients that taste super amazing in the complexity of foods is supported by high calorie ingredients. You know, someone could say like, okay, like what do you eat when you're on a diet? Like, you know, like brown rice, a bit of spices, some chicken, some broccoli. Oh, that sounds good. Why don't you make fucking low calorie chimichanga? I'm like, what the fuck? Aren't those things <laughs> fried in oil? Like, yeah, but you could use like water. Like I'm gonna fry in water. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? So if you're trying to do like a high frequency quad workout, like, all right, like you come in and you do two sacks of hack squats and your friends are like, you're the man. What are you doing next? You're like, uh, not quads because I got to train that shit tomorrow. And you come in and do what? Two sets of leg press, then like one set of squats because your hips starting to hurt a little bit. So there's another concern is that some training is so systemically disruptive and so disruptive to joints and connective tissues because it's just a greater absolute load. You can't actually do it super frequently. What does quad training look like if you train quad six days a week? You're going to squat six days? You're fucking not going to do that. Not for long. Are you going to do squats and leg presses some of the time? Yeah, that's a good idea. Then you'll have to do some lunges and leg extensions. And then all of a sudden, like not all that training is very hard training. So the question is, do you train six days a week? Uh, sort of weird training or do you have really awesome baller training like four days a week well gee man that one just seems like at the very least it's no worse as far as causing gains it's more sustainable and it's it's a way better use of your time too um and, and people don't sort of tend to factor this in but you don't have an infinite psychology of desire to train everyone's as finite some people are just higher than others you do enough warming up for quads. You do enough warming up total in your program over the course of six days a week. You're just going to not want to train anymore. And it's good to be able to warm up just a little bit and get going and then have a great workout and leave. And if you have to warm up every single muscle group because you train every muscle group every day, then it starts to be like either you're not properly warming up the muscle groups unless you're not getting the best training when you do focus in on a muscle group or you do properly warm up and your sessions just take an inordinate amount of time. So it's kind of, you know, some muscles because of the fact that they accumulate, uh, they just take longer to recover because of the fact that they have to be trained so heavy that, 
you have to heavily modify training because of the fact that you have to warm up for them considerably, which ties into their heavy training. It just starts to look like, man, any amount of real, any training is really, really worth it is probably worth doing in such a way that is a little bit on a lower frequency end. Some, you know, two, three or four times a week, not four or five or six times a week. So like your biceps take almost no time to warm up. Uh, they can be trained, you know, you're not mangling your body doing curls. I hope not. I mean, I'm sure some people have done that before. Uh, and you know, your biceps, after you train them very hard, they're not in a mechanically leveraged position to take on a ton of muscle damage. So they don't really ever get sore and your tendons don't hurt. And then you can train them very often. But the assumption that all muscle groups behave that same way is, was wildly inaccurate, right? It basically, it's not that, that it's inaccurate. There's no basis for such an assumption. It's like a, it's like being a, a third grade teacher and assuming all of your children should be able to read at the same speed. Like you talk to any third grade teacher, they just be like, wait, why would the fuck would you ever think that? And they probably wouldn't swear because they're good people that teach the third grade. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it, it would just be like an insane thing to think. They'd be like, no, the assumption is that all children learn it slightly to marginally to very different rates. If you assume that, you're going to be correct and you're going to have excellent teaching strategies. So some kids need more work, some need to be by themselves, some need to go at this pace, some at that. Same way for muscle groups. The assumption that all your body's muscle groups are the wildly different design characteristics, wildly different loading parameters, wildly different training modalities uh, benefit from the same exact training frequency it never really made a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I'm with that for sure. Um, yeah, I think you hit on that pretty, pretty well there, for, uh, definitely. Uh, and then just like, just some just super specific, you know, uh, you kind of mentioned forearms, you probably train pretty often, you don't need to warm up too much for it, not super systemically fatiguing. Uh, you know, w what else, I guess, would fall into that camp? Uh, calves, lateral delt, things of that nature. So we can absolutely talk about specifics like that. But I, what I will say is a very, there's a very different response between very, uh, different individuals. Some people uh, can target muscles better. Some people experience more soreness in some muscles. Uh, some people, just bodies are built a little bit differently. Fiber composition tends to be a little different. So the muscles I say uh, that for me personally and for folks that I've trained and associated with tend to recover faster or slower may not be the case for other people. Some people's hamstrings recover very quickly. Some people's hamstrings recover once every five days or some shit like that, right? So the the, the the end, the absolutely final statement I can make is, or the, the most basic is train muscles as often, tra train them requisitely hard in each session. And then if they recover quickly, train them more often. And if they don't, train them less often, right? So there's only so much you can push for that. But just to get folks started so they're not totally, you know, lacking for any insight, I think like uh, side delts, traps, rear delts, I mean, like how many times you really get sore traps in your life? I mean, like, very novel exercises will do that, but like consistently sore traps? Good God, I mean, that's tough. And what is even a performance reduction in traps? How much do you have to train your traps to get them to really like sink in performance? Like, man, I can't even hold the stiff legged deadlift bar anymore. Like you can train traps into the ground and all they do is grow, 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 grow the more you train them. Good news is a bunch of the side delt and real delt and back training uh, already trains your traps, but you can do shrugs every day, no problem. Uh, also, another one is their amplitude of motion is so small, and their the actual muscle itself doesn't move a whole lot, and it, it tends to disperse force very easily. So all those characteristics, that traps are a very good candidate, side delts, rear delts. Uh, for many people, the forearm flexors, which include the biceps and all the other muscles in there, uh, and, and for some people, not. Uh, some people can seem to train triceps very uh, uh, high frequencies. I myself personally can't. One of the things, my triceps are one of my best body parts, they're one of the strongest muscles I have, one of the biggest, and they just, like, I'm really good at training them so exactly how to load the living shit out of them if you said i had two sets to fuck up my triceps i'd be like hold my beer no problem right whereas if you have two sets to fuck up my biceps i'd be like i'm gonna need eight times more sets than that to fuck up my biceps so uh for uh wrist uh sorry forearms like any kind of wrist curling and stuff that tend to recover very quickly uh calves is an interesting story for me they're rather immediate uh calves can be put into a loaded stretched position and the muscle itself actually has a very uh, long amplitude of motion so it, it does a lot of mechanical work now because of the way the tendons attached uh and because the amplitude of the the foot movement is not very impressive the actual 
uh, you don't get a whole lot of movement out of calf raises, but the muscle itself actually translates quite a bit and generates a shitload of force, uh, especially if you have a faster twitch, larger gastroc, you can get sore as fuck from like four sets of properly done calf raises. When we do calves twice a week, I do calves three or four times a week usually, but twice a week is, is more than enough. Uh, some people can do calves uh, every day. I sort of suspect that many, not all of those people, uh, aren't really training calves in any way that can be described as correct. Because I've seen people be like, I can't grow my calves. When they go to that dildo calf machine with the, the seated one where you just do this, just basically like fucking something with your calves. And then uh, they just they get that trains the slower twitch, smaller soleus and doesn't even train it all that well. It basically leaves your gastrox alone almost completely. And they do like 18 plates for a set of like three reps. And they're like, I can't get my calves to grow. And I'm like, man. And then I like put them on a staircase and just have them do two inches off the staircase with no weight and do like five mile rep sets close to failure with no, with just body weight. And they can't walk for a week and a half. And I'm like, surprise, you've been training calves wrong this entire time. So a lot of people that say the calves recover quick, quickly, I am skeptical of, but I'm not skeptical of all those people. Some people's calves do really recover pretty well. Uh, and, you know, so those are my muscles with high frequencies. There's some, like, for me that don't work but for others work. A lot of people seem to uh, think that they can train various parts of their back relatively frequently. For example, the lats. Some people say they're good to train their lats every other day, every day. For me personally, I'd fall apart into pieces. But I've actually seen lifters do it successfully, do it well, and get away with it no problem. Uh, you know, muscles that tend to be mechanically positioned uh, to take huge loads and <laughs> take huge loads. That uh, seems very perverse. Uh, and then muscles that are, take a lot of stretch uh, under tension uh, and muscles that tend to be faster twitch, uh, they tend to just in most people just not recover very quickly. The quadriceps, right? Like at the bottom of a squat or hack squat or leg press, the feeling of stretch under tension in your quads is like, man, there's, there's some shit is getting broken in here and there's just no way that's going to be like a day to recover this like it's just bad pecs for most people like you do a proper chest training with a deep stretch I mean, they just get really messed up for many people triceps are, are included in that some of the muscles of the back like the spinal erectors like you do deadlifts or stuff like a deadlift they just don't recover overnight uh glutes if proper glute training your glutes get messed up and some people can seem to train glutes pretty hard very frequently but again i suspect a large fraction of those people really aren't training their glutes all that hard or properly they just seem to go through the motions and don't really ever get super close to failure like you know a lot of uh like female trainees say like i train my glutes every day and then you look at what they call glute training and it's like they co-opt every single machine for the worst glute training of all time like the lat the, what is it the assisted pull up they'll like do a one leg press i'm like you walk and produce more force with your glute than that what are you doing so uh glutes i'm sort of you know i still think they they, they tend to um be a lower to moderate frequency muscle group for most people if they are trained uh, correctly and really trained to where they are the limiting factor. Right. Yeah. As you mentioned here, you can kind of intuitively figure out uh, optimal training frequency for most muscle groups. So, you know, when it feels recovered, when you can get back to, you know, baseline performance or improved performance, it makes sense to train that again. Um, but in the evidence-based community right now, high-frequency training is super trendy. Um, specifically, it's advocated for advanced lifters, and the hypothesis behind this is that these lifters experience um, basically the muscle protein synthetic response post-training is not uh, sustained for as long a period of time compared to novice trainees. So I kind of want to get your opinion on that and whether that rationale makes sense. And also, if you could kind of touch on the relationship between training volume within a session and the MPS response, because we, if we perform more volume within a session, shouldn't that lead to, you know, a sustained response for longer? What are the diminishing returns on that, if that kind of all makes sense there? Totally. So... One of the reasons that beginners are demonstrated to have a higher MPS response than the advanced is uh, beginners are trained with more relative volume than they should be in advanced with not enough. So you give beginners five sets of squats and advanced five sets of squats. Well, the advanced are well used to training, so for them five sets is not the optimal per session hypertrophy. Uh, maybe more like eight or ten sets will. And for a true beginner, five sets of squats is like the most they could ever recover from by a long shot and thus it will cause an unbelievable hypertrophic response so you know 
already the comparison is somewhat invalid. So if you adjust for the right training volumes, it turns out beginners do very well with high frequency as well because for them high frequency would be like one working set per session six days a week. And there are studies like that and beginners grow better. So when people say, well, you know, beginners sh can – Beginners can get away with lower frequencies, but they can get away with all kinds of shit. This is sort of a moot point. Um, they do better with higher frequencies too. Um, so, so that's definitely a consideration. Now, the so, th so then we're back to square one of train hard enough to get a good response. Whenever you recover, go again. So it works the same way for beginners and advanced. Um, and the thing is, beginners don't need much training to get a great response, so they can actually train with the same frequencies as advanced. They just uh, – beginners get uh, growth for just as long, but they don't uh, – ha they have a higher amplitude of growth. The area under the curve is thus higher. The area under the curve is lower for the advanced. And then we could say, okay, uh, definitely if we're comparing suboptimal training to optimal training, beginners can get away with lower frequency training, but the advanced sort of can't get away with it now. And then they have to go and do the proper frequency training they're supposed to have been doing the whole fucking time to get the best gains – which is training once you're recovered and not waiting too long. If you go down that road, then you realize that the biggest impediment to advanced gains, specifically to advanced gains rather than beginner gains, is the ability to handle chronic fatigue accumulation and not even chronic fatigue accumulation, but even session to session fatigue. That recovery is usually a bigger impediment to hypertrophic response through training for the advanced then is stimulus. Um, I know very few advanced people that cannot make a proper stimulus during training. Um, and I know very many advanced people that are so motivated that they would do whatever it takes to make as big of a stimulus as they can. The problem is that you say, okay, let's fuck shit up and then high frequency training. Right? 15 sets a session every day per muscle. Well, that's a recovery problem. And uh, yes, while uh, if you consider only uh, myofibrillar protein uh, accumulation and you say, okay, the advanced no longer get as big of a blip. Their blip of hypertrophy, their uh, MPS elevation doesn't last for as long. Duh. Okay. We just do more of these shits back to back to back. Well, you can't because the fatigue is exponentially higher in the advanced than a beginner's. Right? Beginners, you can basically kill one day and then the, day, the next day they show up and they're like, I'm sore, but I'm fine. And then it just gets stronger. And then even if you if you dose them appropriately to where they just get barely sore, they heal and they're like, I'm good. And then they heal and they're like, I'm good. And they basically like have no accumulated fatigue for weeks on end. The advanced can't do that. So what ends up happening is uh, it's more important to consider the fact that the advanced have a recovery problem more than they have a problem of I, I just I need to train more somehow. Yes, if you could cause a robust stimulus without causing as much fatigue, that would be great. Unfortunately, high-frequency training is the very opposite of that. It causes a lot of fatigue, uh, specifically accumulated fatigue, which is precisely where advanced people cannot sustain it. Now, is it, is it a good argument for advanced people to periodically do concentrated phases of very high-frequency training to get good growth? Yes, absolutely. Can beginners get away with not doing those and still grow? Yes, but that's, again, a very moot point because beginners can get away with almost everything. That doesn't mean it's the best idea for beginners. People talk about the same thing with the drug use. They say, well, you know, you do this and that, but, it, you know, it works for drug users. Like, yeah, actually, proper paradise hypertrophy training will work even better for drug users. They can just get away with more. But getting away with stuff is not really an argument that it's the best thing possible. You know, like the United States won World War II with all sorts of practices that modern generals would consider insane. It's not like, well, it works for them. Like, no, it didn't work for them. It cost an extra 100,000 battle casualties. If they had done it this other way, it would have worked even better for the love of God. So, uh, you know, saying that, you know, beginners can get away with low frequency training is not the same thing as saying it's optimal for beginners. Higher frequency, some average higher frequency is better for both. Uh, and before we all get that starlight in our eyes and go ev evidence based, high frequency is the way to go. Finally, Minnie Grogan is an advanced. Understand the cumulative fatigue is a real thing and be prepared to use high frequency training judiciously for a certain mesocycle at a time. And then taking away, not using it as a chronic training tool that will somehow magnify your adaptations because you won't be able to sustain it. So, and kind of based on what you're reporting here, it kind of seems like with this apparent ceiling effect for productive training volume per session, frequency maybe is more or less just a tool to train with high volumes and avoid junk volume. So... 
in the case of, say, a person who has an MRV for back of 25 sets per week, for them it might make sense to utilize a training frequency of three times per week as opposed to two because the amount of sets they would have to perform per session would result in junk volume. I mean, is this, is this kind of what we're getting to here? Like, if it's just really for increased training frequencies or high frequency training are really just a benefit for people with very high MRVs for certain muscle groups to avoid junk volume. Uh, to some extent, yes, and I would also say that MRVs do change based on frequency. Uh, your MRV will be higher, oh, some what higher, the more you go up in frequency. That is capped by a systemic MRV. So especially if you have a very high systemic MRV, uh, a lot of times you can survive higher frequency. And uh, it also depends on how, it, not just MRV, but the length of time your muscles are uh, need to recover after a stimulative session. If you have muscles that recover rather quickly after a stimulative session, you can jam in more productive sessions per week. Um, if you have muscles that require a long time to recover after a stimulative session, it is just, uh, you know, we just like hamstrings, for example, for me. If I do like five sets of hamstrings, sort of no matter how I do them, it takes me half a week to recover back to baseline performance and no, no uh, notable soreness. How the fuck am I going to train my hamstrings four times a week? Yeah, I could squeeze in three. Four would be like some kind of joke. I'd be doing one or two sets of hamstring each time. That's insane, right? So so there's there's limits to that. I will add this is actually a very interesting thing. Uh, we have every reason to believe that faster twitch muscle fibers take longer to recover. We also have every reason to believe they respond better to hypertrophy. And you look at the people that are the biggest in the world, I think be pro bodybuilders, they are very likely to be more fast twitch dominant than otherwise. And they also have very, very large muscles that they're very, very good at training hard and they do lots of volume per session. So when you say to them, hey, you should do a higher training frequency, their understanding of what that would be would be maybe two times a week or three times a week per muscle group. That would be very, very high for them. You know, we say like, well, my biceps recover in, in a day. Well, Ronnie Coleman's biceps his, you know, arm measurements, 22 and a half inches, a contest, 24 off season. That's your legs, motherfucker. Do you train your legs every day? No. Well, then how the hell is Ronnie Coleman supposed to train his triceps every day? Like, right. Okay. His triceps are bigger and stronger than your quads. Like, huh? Okay. Well then he can't train arms every day. No, probably not. We're not all rich Piana, you know? So <laughs> that's messed up. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's, uh, it's, so when people say like, okay, my muscles recover faster, that's great. I can train more often. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you sleep more and eat more and, uh, and train more intelligently, if that's why your muscles are recovering faster, great. But I wouldn't so much envy people whose muscles recover fast uh, because some people say like, oh my God, I can't believe you could recover to train X, Y, Z very often. Well, you know, the people that can train really often are often the ones with the worst genetics for gaining muscle size. As a matter of fact, uh, I've trained uh, in my collegiate uh, strength and conditioning experience. I've trained five and ten thousand meter runners uh, in their weight training in the off season. These people do a max set of ten in the squat, and everything after rep number three is a grinder because that's how slower twitch works. That's just the velocity is just not that high, and they're they take one second between reps and their endurance re up, so they just keep going. So like basically a full like nosebleed ten RM. They rack the bar. They go. <sighs> Okay, that was tough. And they're like, are you going to die? And they're like, why aren't you breathing heavy? They're like, and then they, you, wait, you wait 30 seconds and they do another set of exactly 10 more repetitions. They're like, holy shit. And you're like, man, I better care, be careful with these guys. They're going to get sore. What happens? If they're used to a squatting for a week or two, they don't get sore at all unless you do like 15 or 20 sets of quads per session. And then when they get sore, they recover like a day later. So these people, these are people, real life human beings, five and 10,000 meter runners, that if you take two months of training with them and get them going with their fiber type into a weight resistance uh, type of training, you can get them to do, have quad MRVs of 60 to 100 working sets per week. No problem. Now, you, are, are you envious of these people's genetics? Are you kidding me? If you zoom out of the screen when you watch the race, you're like, do these people even have legs? They're like peg leg people. Right, because their quads are super small, they're all slow twitch, and just recover really fast for none of the reasons you want. So a lot of times people chase higher frequency, and they hit this thing where they're just like, fuck, like my pecs just don't recover that fast. No worries. There's some silver lining to that shit, that if you can't handle ultra high frequency, it probably means you're due for bigger gains. And that's very often the case.
In in the recent example I provided, you know, let's just continue with someone who has an MRV of 25 sets for back, and uh, frequency of three times per week may very well be be excellent. But there might be some people would say, well, if you split that up into four sessions per week and you performed four or five sets for back per session, uh, under the context you're able to recover, this would result in more volume load for a given number of sets. And this person may very well say, yeah, if I perform lap pull downs, you know, on Thursday instead of after barbell rows on Tuesday, my performance is better. So if I can accumulate more total work, for a given amount of sets, that should be superior for hypertrophy. Is, is this person onto something, or is this kind of yeah. misguided? No, they're they're absolutely onto something. And more specifically, because the sessions are shorter, your local fatigue is more likely to be a limiting factor than systemic fatigue. Like after five sets of bent rows, you're still fucking jacking your back up every time you're able to connect with the muscle and take it to its uh, its failure very close. You know, after 10 sets of back, who knows why you're not getting good contractions anymore. You're probably just like, I just don't want to fucking be here. You're just tired. You're, you know, the system has its limits. And especially if you're doing workouts of like mu multiple muscles and then back is one of them and you have to do 10 sets of back at the end of a work. I mean, good God, a whole lot of that is junk volume. So that sort of logic doesn't just work for higher frequency training per muscle group. It, it actually works even better for higher frequency training period of sessions per week. Um, like, uh, you know, Jared Feather, for example, uh, one of my training partners, he trains, he's currently training with 10 sessions per week. So he does six uh, sessions every, uh, so every week he does six AM sessions and four of the days of the week he does uh, PM sessions as well. And that allows every single session to never be more than about 10 or 15 total work sets, which means he, every single set is super high quality. Because it, 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 it's funny, like um, we had a question once in, uh, in my work capacity, we had a question about one of our products. It was like uh, it was one of the hypertrophy templates, and there was a the beginner and, and, and advanced, and the beginner one had two, uh, three, four, five, and six day option per week, and the advanced one had only like I think four, five, and six, uh, maybe three, four, five, and six, and someone asked like they're like why isn't there a two day a week advanced option? We're just like, my friend, like dear <laughs> friend, if you are advanced, you can't possibly do justice to your muscles in two fucking sessions a week. Are you out of your mind? What would that look like? You're in the gym for eight hours at a time, right? Like, yeah, look, again, like I said earlier, no, not everyone's Rich Piana, right? We don't have magic powers. So uh, can you guys still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's just one of these situations where if you can keep your workout shorter and sweeter, that's usually better. Until and unless you run into two problems. One is the workouts are so short that they are no longer sweet. Okay, uh, like you are barely warmed up and you've done one or two working sets, you're well into the groove and you're like, okay, time to stop and come back later. And eh, that has its efficiency trade offs uh, over the course of the week. It also has you doing much more warming up. Um, and, and the next problem is uh, if you split up the muscle recovery to multiple sessions and the performance is really super high, the joints and connective tissues might not be able to catch up. So when you get later into a lifting session, let's say sets num set numbers six through 10, you're using not as much weight and your volume of work isn't as impressive. That means two things. One, your relative hypertrophic stimulus for each one of those sets is not as high as it was for sets one through five. But also it's joint connective tissue damage is minimal. Also, you've warmed up very, very well by then and the joint connective tissue disruption is just very low. On the other hand, so if you start splitting everything up, you can say, okay, I can train heavy every single time because I only do five sets per session. I can train everything heavier. You're now training so much heavier on average and so often that your joints and connective tissues cannot catch up to your muscles because joints and connective tissues do not recover as fast as muscle tissue. So all of a sudden you're in this thing where like, oh yeah, hypothetically, I should get these amazing performances out of my bent rows and pull downs if I only do four or five sets of back every session. Yes, that's very true, but it won't last because joint connective tissue recovery will not meet you there. So is it okay to do that in the short term? Yes, absolutely. But in the long term, it might not work out. Like we've, we've all had our hypotheticals turn on us. I've had situations where I'm like, I'm going to train my hamstrings four times a week. I actually try that. And uh, by the third week, my hamstrings were in a position where if I was to actually train them in the recovered state, I would have to do like one set per session. I was like, well, this is stupid hypothesis refuted, <laughs> right? Um, so so that, that's just the way it is. So those folks absolutely do have a point. 
but it is a point that not, kind of cannot be infinitely taken uh, to an extreme. So, because, you know, that same point, you could say, okay, what's your best set as far as volume load? It's your first set after warm up, right? You get 10 squats, you might get seven on the second set. Um, it should all just be first sets. Should we be doing 14 sessions of quads a week? like two a days and some three a days, like 14 total work sets, really good. But each one of those is the highest fucking quality shit. Totally. Except by the fifth day, you'll like your hips will break open like Mr. Potato Head and then what? Right. And then, and then nothing good comes of that. So, yeah. Some excellent points. Um, with, with this, I kind of want to get into, you know, a theory of a floor or a minimum number of sets that needs to be performed per session in order to generate a sufficient anabolic response. Um, do you think there's something there physiologically, or is it maybe just more so like a result of like convenience? So like you just took 30 minutes to warm up to perform two working sets, and that's just a waste of time. And that's really where the detriment is here. Or is there something physiologically where it's probably not enough work to achieve what we want as far as muscle hypertrophy goes? Mm -hmm. So I've received some resistance on my speculation on the theoretical uh, minimum baseline. And I will have to say that it's not unprecedented in biological systems to have a minimum baseline that is dose, session dose dependent. Uh, we know pretty well that maximum muscle protein synthesis from nutritional interactions, how much protein you take in at any one time, probably has a floor. And that any less taken in at one time might have a nonlinear downside. Like I, I don't think that if you eat protein every 10 grams every hour that you're going to shrink to nothing. Absolutely false. I think that's going to be a very excellent strategy to gain muscle. But eating protein four or five times a day in larger boluses might actually have a net nonlinear escalation. So it's not that one of them doesn't work at all. It's that the, it's the same total daily protein, but splitting up into smaller doses may actually be more effective. Um, so just the same way when people say, well, no, like any rep or set you do linearly contributes to hypertrophy and there is no, there is no bottom end that, that exponentially rises. I'm not entirely convinced that we can make that assumption. Also, no one's ever trained like that. So that's another fun fact. So before people speculate, I would like to see someone actually do, you know, one set of pull-ups every hour or some shit and then get the biggest back of all time. Uh, it hasn't been done yet. Um, and I do think that uh, you could call them practical concerns of like warm-up time and stuff. And for me, more of a concern is like joint and connective tissue recovery and systemic fatigue because you get up to those kinds of crazy volumes that, that can allow and use those crazy weights fresh all the time. Then you're going to run into problems. But I'm not willing to rule out uh, sort of not minimum effective uh, dose per session, but a real steep incline, a real steep curve. Um, I, I'll posit the following. This is a very hypothetical, but I'm willing to wager something for it. I think if you don't get a robust pump and a sensation that the muscle has been fatigued, I don't think you're seeing your best per unit hypertrophy results. So I think if you do see a robust pump in the muscle, I think if your muscle is notably fatigued locally, we're like, ooh, okay, so there's definitely been some disruption. I think you're good to go. And there's a number of session sizes that check out those boxes. And there's some longer ones and the shorter ones. The shorter ones are probably better, but the longer ones are almost as good. Too long, definitely bad. But I definitely think like if you do one set of squats, and you get neither a very good pump nor perception of, of disruption, that I honestly think that if you do two sets of squats um, and do it a little bit less frequently, you may actually get more hypertrophy than just spreading out uh, just one set at a time. And if you're really serious about one set at a time, maybe you're serious about one rep at a time. Uh, and they have actually tested this, and it turns out if you do a rep, rest, do a rep, rest, do a rep, rest, it doesn't actually work as well. Um, and so there are pretty well-described mechanisms as to how that works, there are no very good descriptions of mechanisms as to a minimum threshold of muscle growth from sessions works, but I'm not willing to rule one out. And because no one's ever gotten super jacked training just with one set at a time and twice a day or whatever, I'm also saying that there's not any evidence that for that supposition. Uh, put another way, I think the supposition that there is no nonlinear function between growth and per session volume is what has to be shown. That has to be proven because no one's ever been jacked like that. You say, okay, you know, everyone does the session rest session paradigm. They do like some really decent work and then they rest. And that's how everyone ever has gotten jacked. But, uh, well, I think that's bullshit. Prove it, right? Prove it. Prove to us 
that one set and then resting eight hours and then one set and then resting eight hours prove that that works and then and then you can show that the that you're correct um uh, so so those, those are my uh, opinions on the matter so yeah pr- in my hard defense of of the practice of sessions uh, being of a, at least a moderate size i would say the practicality the warm-ups the joint connective tissue stuff that is absolutely a thing but i'm not willing to rule out uh my sort of soft defense is i think there is something to a session of a minimum size that may have um and and, and tons of body systems have thresholds um for where the balance of various activation and deactivation factors has to tilt in in favor. And like if you're having activation factors sum up until they balance over this other threshold, nothing actually happens. Uh, so there's all kinds of biological systems that do that. It would not be surprising if hypertrophy was one. It would make great evolutionary sense that your body doesn't really prefer to grow muscle. It's metabolically very expensive and complicated. It takes a long time. It, uh, with the immune infiltration required to grow lots of muscle through uh, late onset soreness, for example, for very large sessions, you're actually mildly incapacitated while you're growing muscle. So you're, to some extent, your performance is uh, down. So uh, perhaps the, the human body from a musculoskeletal level doesn't uh it actually needs a really good message to grow muscle it's, it works really well with the overload principle like I, I, you know one set of squats no matter how hard your body might after a while be like mm, are we really serious about really needing this muscle right and if you do th- three or four sets your body's like okay fuck 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 like great we're gonna throw all the machinery at this so there may there may still be discoveries on that end yeah excellent yeah um, we, we've kind of touched on a couple of potential uh, negatives, of high frequency training here, you know, connective tissue uh, integrity, uh, the practicalities of warm up time. And then, you know, maybe if you're not programming it well, uh, not reaching this this floor or threshold amount of volume. Um, just one more thing I want to I want to touch on here before Cole uh, wraps us up is that do you think there's a potential negative from a muscle pump or cell swelling perspective for full body training since we have to uh, shunt blood throughout our entire body rather than being able to focus it into particular muscle groups? Could that compromise gains in any way? Uh, Yeah, so then for program structure, you end up, if you're really high frequency for every muscle group, you sort of train your whole body every day. Um, I think there is a potential for that, uh, that blood shunting to to be a thing. Um, One thing you'll notice if you do uh, higher frequency training is if you train a muscle really hard and then you leave it alone versus if you train a muscle hard and then you train another muscle after it. And then even if you come back to training that muscle, you actually get less sore by training other muscles in conjunction with that muscle. Somebody could say like, that's great. Uh, That means you can train more. I'm not so sure. Uh, I think maybe one of the reasons you're getting sore is there's less disruption because of less metabolite pooling in the target muscles um, less cell swelling that is sustained, less of a pump. Uh, and at the very least, after you train a muscle, the best thing you can possibly do for it is l- leave the whole body alone to recover and rest and feed. Um, so if you want the biggest chest possible, after you're done training chest, you go home and you relax. Um, if you have to train every muscle part in your body every time, gee, you know, it really rips the other muscles off. Maybe a more concerted effort on one muscle will work a little bit better. Um, so, so I, so I think that's, that's, um, that might be the case. Maybe. Awesome. All right, Mike, wrapping things up here, give the audience uh, a little insight to what your current training frequency is. Uh, I'm pretty sure your recent Instagram post, you're slowly gaining right now. So maybe give a little context into, and some insight into what your training frequency is surrounding this nutritional phase that you're in. (laughs) And then totally. also, what is the highest frequency you've utilized for major muscle groups and kind of your personal experience with that kind of pros and cons? Totally. So uh, right now, our phase, we're doing most of the large muscle groups twice a week and the smaller ones three times a week. Um, it's because we're relatively fatigued from this fat loss phase we just finished. And um, I have another very super hard diet coming up starting in about month and a half and i want to grow a little bit of muscle but not really expend too much fatigue uh because i'll need it for that super hard diet so that's one of the reasons why i'm currently doing a sort of moderate frequency plan the highest frequency i've ever tried is uh so i'll I'll tell you there's two things one is total number of sessions per week for several weeks on end for 
eight weeks on end, I have done 11 sessions per week. Uh, that's a two a day and every day except for Saturday, and then Sunday is rest, and Saturday is one a day. Uh, that was sustainable uh, for eight weeks, but barely, and um, it was really, 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 really tough. And then it ended up being systemically unsustainable, where basically my training partners and I just didn't want to train anymore. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, we love training, so that's saying a lot. Uh, and it was kind of like, it was tough, you know, because you would come in and your back would be sore and you have to train legs and you're like, oh, like, what the fuck? Like, I'm supposed to squat with a sore back. Like, it just got really tough. Uh, it caused great, great gains. Um, and then the highest frequency per muscle group that I ever trained with is I have trained my uh, side delts, or rear delts, and to some extent traps, uh, five times a week for many, many weeks on end, no problem. And I have trained my biceps five times a week, uh, no problem. And I have trained my quads, hams, glutes, chest and back, and front delts four times a week. Uh, but I did that for two weeks. And deloaded and stopped <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it was uh, not sustainable for two reasons. One, it was on a 12 session split because training muscles that often, like if you're going to make that kind of frequency, you're going to have to give muscles room to train on their own, right? If training a muscle with a higher frequency by just training a shitload of other muscles with it is to me fucking really stupid. Like, uh, if I'm going to train a muscle with a higher frequency, it had better be in conjunction with having a lot of its own time or being trained with only one other muscle, right? So in order to give justice to the four-time-a-week frequency approach, we had to do 12 sessions a week. I couldn't survive that. Um, so... Uh, but I, uh, on the 11-session plan, and uh, we did a 9-session plan uh, just these last couple of mesos, we did uh, legs twice a week and then chest and back uh, and I suppose front delts and triceps uh, three times a week. And that is like my sweet spot, beautiful frequency. I love it. So like side delts, rear delts, traps, forearms, biceps uh, get – and uh, yeah, they get trained uh, four times a week, um, three times a week for all the other major muscle groups, uh, triceps included, and calves, and then twice a week for quads, glutes, and hams. And that to me was like, notice the differences between all the muscles, right? Uh, and that to me, it was like a really, really nine times a week. That was a very, very sustainable, very, very awesome split. Anything between six times a week to 11 times a week with an average of nine being really great for me works super well. Uh, but the sustainability of six days a week is essentially infinite. Uh, and the sustainability of uh, 12 uh, is two weeks. So every everything in, in between there. So. Awesome. And, and for the listeners, that works best for Dr. Mike. You know, uh, people, people may go out now and, and, and Take what you just said there and apply it to their own training and then come to you like, Dr. Mike, I just utilized what you said on the podcast and I'm And I'm apart. dead, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say, if you want to be as big as me, do exactly what I do. <laughs> Don't let these guys here lie to you, oh, science bullshit, evidence-based. Copy your heroes. <laughs> Verbatim. I'll, I'll let you guys know how much weight I lift on all these exercises. You can do the same exact weight. Uh, yeah, no, very, very good disclaimer. Uh, all the stuff, you know, it's interesting too. I've experienced something really, really fascinating on social media lately. I mean, I'm experiencing lately. It doesn't mean it's a new phenomenon. Uh, people have asked me like, hey, like how, how many sets do you do for chest? And I'm like, well, here's my chest recommendation guide. It's 11 pages of scientifically backed data on how you should train your chest. And they're like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So what do you do? I'm like, fuck, for the love of God, why does it matter? <laughs> uh, and uh, I still can't really figure that one out. Uh, who knows? Maybe they think I'm lying about my chest recommendations. I'm hiding the shit, the good shit I keep, you know. For sure. Uh, all right, Mike. Uh, for anyone, for some reason, that is not following you on the social media platforms, where are you most active? Where can our listeners follow and support you at? Great questions. So Instagram, R-P-D-R-M-I-K-E. The company I help run, RP Strength, uh, at RP Strength on Instagram. Uh, really great resources there. And that links to all the website stuff. We have tons of free stuff and books and all this other crazy stuff. 
I will also say that we're boosting the RP Strength YouTube channel now. We're producing uh, tons and tons of content. So sign up uh, for be a subscriber for RP Renaissance Periodization uh, on YouTube. And I am, we're putting out like three videos, mostly content, super educational videos every single week. Um, and we're going to continue to do that for probably years to come. So it's really great. Uh, there's videos there that are an hour and 15 minutes long about training principles. Really, really good stuff. So I would go there. You know, before, in the old times, I would say Facebook. But nowadays, Facebook is like a fucking weird place where I'll say something I think is relevant that on Instagram gets like a, tr a ton of virality. And on Facebook, like, nobody, like, two people like it. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, <laughs> it's so weird. I hope they're making a lot of money on Facebook because... Uh, it used to be like back in 2014, I would make a detailed post on Facebook. It would get like a thousand likes and 50 trillion shares and it'd be like, oh my God, this is great. Like that's kind of how I made my name is through like intellectual exercises on Facebook. And then nowadays I make a similar post and I have like double the followers I've ever had and nobody fucking sees it. Like, I don't know. You guys have an experience on Facebook? It's just like, I don't even know what the, what is Facebook for anymore? Is it for people's moms that complain about vaccines? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, is it the algorithm thing that's going on? There's something... Yes. Face, evil evil overlords the, of Facebook it's the controlling. It's the, it's the <laughs> Russian lizard people, Bill Gates, 5G. It's all connected, folks. I don't know how, but I'm figuring it out. <laughs> all right, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for being on here today. Hope the listeners enjoyed. I know Mike and I have for sure. It's been a true pleasure. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course. All right, guys. Uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Again, hope you really enjoyed. Take it easy.